Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the second episode in the short-term rental series. If you have not listened to the first one, please go back and listen to that one first because we want to make sure that everybody has a full understanding of what's going on. And these episodes will build upon each other. Um, that being said, today we're going to be covering some of the technical aspects of the real estate professional status um, that you're going to want to understand um, including the code sections, what it means to materially participate, uh, where it's reported on the tax returns, and a few other items. But before we jump right into today's episode, I do we do want to remind you about the Facebook community, Tax Smart Real Estate Investors, uh, that has over a thousand members and counting. A ton of great conversations going on in there. Uh, we constantly keep it updated with new tax law changes and with the Biden, the new Biden. Uh, changes that are in the pipeline, uh, you're not going to want to miss out on any news that comes out because it may just save you a few thousand dollars knowing what's coming up the pipeline. So you can join the group by visiting www.facebook.com slash groups slash tax smart investors, or simply visiting Facebook, typing in tax smart real estate investors, and you'll be able to find the group quite easily from there. Um, last thing before we dive right in, we do want to remind everybody again about the tax strategy foundation course, 12 hour course, five modules, real estate tax from A to Z, including the short term rental strategy, and many other strategies, that are going to help you minimize your tax liability as you grow your rental portfolio. You can learn more about that by going to www.therealestatecpa.com, clicking on the education tab, and you'll be able to find a link that takes you to uh, a website with more information on the course. The course is only 897, but if you use the promo code RECPA, again, that's promo code RECPA, you will be able to get $100 off. So we'll look forward to seeing you in that community. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and dive right into today's episode. Yeah, I actually want to take one second to talk about that community. So I, I launched the course back in October, October 2020, and we've done three launches. And through those three launches, we've had about 105 or so people come through the course, um, really, really positive reviews. I was, I was actually pleasantly surprised, which was great. Uh, but we switched it to an evergreen model and reduced the price. So now it's an 897. It's a self-study. Um, it, you'll have access to the content forever. And you have access to a community for everybody that's going through the course. So you can, you can ask questions about the modules as you are learning about them. So I'd love to see you in there. But like, like Tom said, if you use code RECPA at checkout, you get $100 off. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So last episode, we kind of gave a primer on this whole short term rental loophole, why it's important, who it can benefit. And we went over the fact that if you are a high income earner, and or, or you're working a full time job, you don't have to be a high income earner. But if you're working a full time job, or you're running a business full time, and you buy rental properties, you can't claim the losses against your W-2 income or your business income because you have to be a real estate professional. And one of the one of the hurdles to real estate professional status is spending more time in real estate than anywhere else. So you can't the the theory goes that you can't spend more time in real estate than your full time job or than than you do running a business. But if you if you're buying short term rentals. And a short-term rental is defined as the average period of customer use is seven days or less. So if you're buying short-term rentals, it's not considered a rental activity under Section 469. Therefore, you don't have to qualify as a real estate professional in order to take the losses. You just have to materially participate. So we're going to go through today what some of this means. We're going to go through the technical pieces of it. And we're going to start with the treasury reg section that allows us, it's that carve out that I just described that seven days or less. So let me let me go through that real quick. So Treasury Regulation Section 1.469-1 cap T, E3-2 cap A says that certain activities are not considered rental activities if you meet one of five tests. Now I'm just going to read number one. You can always go and Google Treasury Reg Section 1.469-1 cap T and you can see all five tests. But the first test is a rental is not considered a rental activity. I know it sounds weird, but a rental is not considered a rental activity if the average period period of customer use is seven days or less. So what does that mean? That means if, if I stay in your short-term rental for eight days 
and then Tom comes and stays in your short-term rental for six days. You'll have a combined total of 14 days of customer use between two customers. So what's the average? It's seven days. You meet the seven day or less exception and you don't have a rental activity, meaning that you don't have to, you don't have to qualify as a real estate professional on that short term rental activity. You do still have to materially participate. So when, when we're talking about short term rentals here, really what we're talking about are most Airbnbs and VRBOs. We're talking about hotels, motels. Uh, there's been tax court cases with dorms and hospital boarding areas, but for our purposes on the podcast, we're primarily talking about vacation rental homes, Airbnbs and VRBOs. Awesome. Awesome. And you know, one of the areas of confusion around Airbnb, Airbnbs, VRBO, short-term rentals in general is how they are depreciated. Uh, because often these short-term rental properties are houses. There may be a beach house or a house in the residential area of uh, in a desirable location that some people will want to visit. Um, and many people believe they should be depreciated like a residential home um, that would be depreciated over 27 and a half years. However, um, this is simply not the case uh, in many, uh, because of what we're going to talk about in just one second, uh, they often depreciate over 39 years. Yeah. Short-term rentals are considered non-residential property. And I know that sounds a little weird, but here's why. Former reg section 1.167K-3C1 was removed in 1993 but it was referenced in a 2011 CCA, which means that we can still reasonably rely on these, these, th this former reg section uh, for guidance. So it says that if more than 50% of dwelling units in a building are used on a transient basis, it's a non-residential property. Transient basis means occupied by a series of tenants who each stay less than 30 days. So if I have a beach home and it's a single family home, I have one dwelling unit. So 100% of my dwelling units then would be rented on a transient basis because all of my tenants are going to stay seven days or less because I want to, I want to meet that exception. Because of that, I have a non-residential property and it's depreciated over 39 years. Yeah. And uh, there are some benefits to having a non-residential property. And uh, the biggest one probably by far is that hundred you can use 100% bonus depreciation on qualified, opportunity, excuse me, qualified improvement property, also known as QIP. Um, and qualified improvement property is any improvement to the building's interior that is not A, an enlargement of the building, any elevator or escalator. Uh, don't find too many of those in residential homes. Um, at least that I'm aware of, and then uh, internal structural framework of the building. Uh, so that is a huge benefit because that basically means a lot of the improvements that you're doing to the inter to the interior of that property will qualify as qualified improvement property, which we know is depreciated over 15 years. And thanks to the CARES Act, the re one of the recent bills that was passed, it was now fixed um, to. Um, allow it to be depreciated using 100% bonus depreciation, which is huge for short-term rental investors. Yeah, and qualified improvement property can can include like plumbing, electrical. It, it, can, it can include things behind the walls too. So theoretically, a, a lot of your build-out could be qualified improvement property. But you can also use Section 179 on non-residential property. You cannot, this is typically a point of confusion with investors, you, you cannot use Section 179 on residential rental property. So if I go buy a fourplex, I can't go use Section 179 to write off the different improvements that I'm doing to the building. Um, I can use Section 179 to write off like a lawnmower or a laptop that helps me manage my fourplex, but I can't, I can't use Section 179 for anything that goes into my fourplex because it's residential property, 27 and a half years. But on 39-year property, non-residential property, I, I can now use Section 179 on roofs, HVACs, and fire protection systems. So if I replace the roof, I can immediately expense the improvement cost via Section 179. Now, the drawback to Section 179 is that it's it's not like bonus depreciation in that it will help me go negative, right? So if I have a net operating loss and then I use Section 179, the Section 179 expense is actually suspended and it's carried forward. So it can't make you go negative and it also cannot increase your loss. 
whereas bonus depreciation can make you go negative and it can increase your loss. Section 179 gets capped when you hit $0 of net operating income. Bummer, bummer, bummer. <laughs> so moving right along to the next item here, we have uh, material participation. So as we discussed in the previous episode, um, if your rental activity is has an average stay of seven days or less, it's not considered a rental activity for the section for the purposes of section 469. Instead, it's considered a business. And on all businesses, uh, you got to take a look at the material participation test to determine whether the activity is passive or non-passive. If you materially participate, then it's a non-passive activity. If you don't materially participate, then it's a passive activity. So when we're dealing with the short-term rentals, we have to make a determination do you materially materially participate? And generally speaking, if you're using a short-term rental strategy, especially in the first year you own it, you want to material participate so that you can take the losses and make them non-passive. So there are seven tests um, for material participation um, and you can Google them. You can find all seven. However, for most new business owners who are coming into this as a new business, uh, you really want to look at the three most common ones. And that's a, you're spending 500 hours or more on the activity, or or B, you're spending at least 100 hours and more than anybody else who's working on that activity. And the third test is that you're doing substantially everything, which essentially means you're you're running the show uh, solo by yourself um, or with your spouse. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Right. So so if you buy a short term rental and it's five hours away. Like, like it's a five hour car drive or it's a multi hour plane ride. You're probably going to need a property manager to manage that short term rental unless you set up great systems and you're a great operator. And that's what I was kind of referring to last episode when I said, if you're not willing to operate the short term rentals, then the tax benefits will not come. So you got to be willing to operate the rentals. So I buy a short term rental five hours away. I've got to figure out how to spend 500 hours in the activity or like Tom said, these are all ors. I only have to meet one of these tests, 500 hours or 100 hours and more than anyone else or substantially all of the participation in the activity is my participation. So if I don't have a property management company, then the substantially all participation is a contender for me. And what that means is, you know, I can, in theory, don't hold me to this. So I'm a tax advisor, but I'm not your tax advisor. So, so don't hold me to this next statement, please. Uh, in theory, I could spend 50 hours managing the activity, right? And, and I pulled 50, you know, out of my out of my hat. I mean, it could be any amount of time, but as long as my hours are substantially all of the participation in the activity, then I'm good. So let, let's think about 50 hours. If nobody else participates and I spend 50 hours booking the guests, um, coordinating with, uh, with, with check-ins, I, I, I clean everything myself. I do all the repairs myself. And throughout the year, it takes me 50 hours to do all of that. Nobody else really participates. Nobody else really touches it aside from me. Well, my participation in that instance is substantially all the participation and the activity. Therefore, I am materially participating. Uh, so that can be, if you're strategic about it, that can be something that, that you aim for. Now, most what happens with, with people owning short-term rentals, though, is that they have a property management company or they self-manage it, but they have cleaning crews. So now let's apply the same 50 hours, but I did all the management. So I coordinated with the tenants. I collected rents. I did all the marketing, the advertising. Um, I coordinated with contractors. And let's say... I had a cleaning person come throughout the year. They were great. And they spend two hours cleaning the property at every turnover. And I had 20 turnovers throughout the year. So I had 20 guests. Then that cleaning person is going to spend 40 hours. So if I spent 50 hours and the cleaning person spends 40 hours, then I'm spending 50 out of 90 total hours that's not going to be substantially all. So my participation in that example is not going to be substantially all the participation in the activity during the year. Therefore, I'm not going to meet that test. So if I can't meet the substantially all test, then I have to look towards the 100 hours and more than anyone else. 
And that can get complicated too, because how are you going to spend a hundred hours on a short-term rental activity managing it, especially if it's at a distance, that's going to be very difficult to prove. And so what do people do? People book education and research time. They record their travel time. And just like real estate professional status, remember material participation hours, real estate professional status hours, they're all the same. Same rules apply here. You can't count your travel time. You can't count your research time. You can't count your education time. You can't count your investor level time unless you're involved in the day-to-day activities of the short-term rental. So you have to, you can really only count the time that you spend managing the property, actually managing the property. What does that mean? What does a property manager do? Think through all the tasks that a property manager does. That's what you need to be doing. Those are the hours that are going to count towards the material participation test. So how? So then the next question becomes, how do you hit 100 hours and more than your cleaning crew? That's typically the, the hurdle that we've at least worked through with our clients. And, and here's the other thing too. The other funny thing about this is that it, we're going to see on next episode, there are, uh, when we go through tax court cases, how taxpayers have lost uh, when they have short-term rentals. And one of the interesting things is on this 100 hours and more than anyone else test, if you don't know how long or how much time anyone else spends in your rental, then you're not going to be able to prove that you spent more time than them. So if Tom's my property manager on my short-term rental and I'm aiming for this 100 hours or more than anyone else test, I can record my time and maybe it's 115 hours. So I hit the 100 hours, but I also have to hit that that second part and more than anyone else. Well, if I have no idea how long time how, how long Tom spent in the activity, managing the activity, then I can't prove that even though I spent 115 hours, I can't prove that that was more than Tom. And we're going to see that in the tax court cases that we reviewed next episode. Absolutely. And one thing I do want to point out before we do move on to the next section is that you have to remember that if you are married, that the time that you and your spouse uh, and or your spouse uh, perform do count towards material participation. So you do not have to carry the burden alone um, if you are in that position, just something to keep in mind when it comes to the material participation. Absolutely. And, and to further that, that thought, you can't double count time. So if my spouse and I go to the grocery store together for our short-term rental, or we, we go to Home Depot together for our short-term rental, you can't like double count your time, right? You, you can't say, oh, well, we get two, two X the, the trip to Home Depot and back, two X that time. You, you can't do that. But you can, if, if your spouse is working on the rental and you're also working on the rental, you're doing the rehab, you're doing the cleaning, uh, maybe you're both coordinating with guests at different times. You can combine hours, like Tom said. So that that's certainly something to plan for. You can be a team, and that's that's different than real estate professional status, right? Real estate professional status. If you go if you go listen to that series that we recorded last month, you will see that one person has to qualify as a real estate professional completely on their own. And then material participation tests for, for the purposes of the material participation test, you can count your spouse's time. Well, in this case, we don't have to qualify as a real estate professional. So we're just looking at material participation. And again, spousal time counts. So we can combine spouse time for the purposes of material participation. For information on material participation, you can check out reps episode uh, 02 and 03. We went into a pretty deep dive in those episodes. Uh, so go check those out. Um, but now, you know, the next thing that comes to uh, mind is substantial services, right? So um, Airbnbs, uh, short-term rentals in general, uh, sometimes they do come with a bedding, bed and breakfast component of it. After all, it is co- called Airbnb for a reason. And then we have to ask ourselves, does that rise to the level of substantial services? Because if it does, it has to be reported on Schedule C, and it's now more of an active business than simply uh, more like a rental activity. Um, so Things that would constitute substantial services are things that you would do for your guests while they're staying at the property, kind of like a hotel, right? So you might have daily maid and laundry services to come in and clean up every day. Maybe you make breakfast or other meals. Maybe you take them on tours. I mean, there's a number of other things that you may be able to provide them that are considered substantial. 
Yeah. And, and I want to add to that too. The substantial services are provided for the convenience of your guest. Uh, so you also kind of have to think about what amenities do my guests have access to? Do they have access to an a, like the pool that's, that's run by the HOA? Um, do they have access to boogie boards and surfboards that I've left behind? Do they, am I paying for a, some sort of subscription service that they benefit from while they stay at my rental? We, we've heard people like, like subscribe to tour services or hiking services or, um, lessons and things like that, that they then pass this benefit on to their tenants. All of those things can be considered substantial services. And if you're doing enough of these, you may trip this up. So be really careful. And, and you, you, you may want to report it on Schedule C. It just kind of depends on your facts and circumstances. But the substantial services component of it is going to drive whether or not you report this on Schedule E or on Schedule C. And I think sometimes people get, get caught unknowingly providing substantial services. And, and it's just all these little things that, that are for the convenience of your guest. Yeah. And remember when you do report on schedule C, you're now going to be subject to self-employment tax, which can be up to 15.3% uh, on your income, depending on what level of income and what sources you have, uh, what sources of income you have in other places. Um, but kind of continuing on with substantial services, we got to go through what is not considered to be substantial. And this is going to be things that go on when the property is not occupied, meaning when a tenant's not in it. Repairs, cleaning during turnovers, maintenance, trash removal. Uh, these items are typically not considered to be substantial services as something you don't necessarily have to worry about uh, getting uh, caught up in. So this is kind of interesting because you could have a short-term rental that's not a Section 469 rental activity, but it's also not a service business because you're not providing substantial services. Therefore, you wouldn't report it on Schedule C you would report it on Schedule E. And, and to kind of further back that up, let's take a look at two IRS publications. The first is IRS Pub Publication 527. Here's a quote from IRS Publication 527. If you provide substantial services that are primarily for your tenant's convenience, such as regular cleaning, changing linens, or maid services, you report your rental income and expenses on Schedule C. IRS Publication 334, if you are a real estate dealer who receives income from renting real property or an owner of a hotel, motel, etc., who provides services, made services, for guests, report the rental income and expenses on Schedule C. If you are not a real estate dealer or, or the kind of owner described in the preceding sentence, report the income and expenses on Schedule E. For more information, see Pub 527, which is the first one that we just read. Now, again, Pub, 3, Pub 334 says, if you're a real estate dealer who receives income or you're providing these services, these substantial services. So that now, now let's think about real estate dealer. What, what is a real estate dealer? A real estate dealer, you are a real estate dealer if you're engaged in the business of selling real estate to customers with the purpose of making a profit from those sales. Most of our like, like if you're just investing in these short-term rentals, you're not a real estate dealer. So if you're not a real estate dealer, then what it all boils down to is substantial services. Are you or are you not providing substantial services to your guests while they stay at your rental? Um, we, we don't believe that turning a rental unit over after your guest is gone is providing substantial services to your guest. We just think that that's a unit turn and therefore... Most short-term rentals are going to be reported on Schedule E unless you are providing substantial services, as we previously said. And to dive into this even further, so so at this point, we we typically get some questions that you know people say, well, you know, my CPA says it's still Schedule C and it shouldn't be on Schedule E. So let, let's dive into this even further. The real the real question here is whether or not my short-term rental net profit or loss, or really my net profit, should be subject to self-employment taxes. Self-employment tax is a 15.3% tax on earned income from a trader business. IRC section 1402A says that you exclude 
rents from rental real estate unless they are received in the course of a trade or business as a real estate dealer. So basically, rental income is not going to be subject to self-employment tax unless you're a real estate dealer or unless your short-term rental business can be classified as a service business. So there will be a point where you're providing enough substantial services, and it doesn't have to be a whole lot, but there, there, there will be a tipping point where you're providing enough substantial services where your short-term rental business should actually be considered a service business, not a rental business. When we, when we onboard clients that have short-term rentals, we will typically do some exhaustive analysis on whether or not their short-term rental business is actually a service business or a rental business. We're not going to be able to dive into everything here because, like I said, it is exhaustive. Uh, but in general, if you're providing those substantial services, you could trip it. Your, your short-term rentals could be considered a service business not merely the rents of not not merely renting out units of tangible property uh so so be careful there now where do cpas and tax advisors mess this up a lot of cpas and tax advisors think that because treasury reg section 1.469-1 cap t e32 cap a says if you have a, a rental activity and, and on average it's seven days or less per customer, it's not a rental activity. A lot of advisors think that because of that exception, that seven days or less exception, because it says it's not a rental activity, then it must automatically be a Schedule C business. And that is not true. That is not true. Just because it's not a rental activity does not mean that it rises to the level of a trader business of a services business that should be reported on Schedule C and subject to self-employment tax. All right. So the next question people always ask is, well, what happens if I want to use this property personally? After all, you might have a beautiful vacation rental right on the beach and it's just so tempting to go spend four weeks there, right? It just might be an amazing experience and you just can't help yourself. But you do have to be cognizant of this because you are trying to do this for business purposes. So personal use of the property that is 15 days or more throughout the year or that's more than 10% of the total number of days the property was rented at a fair rental rate uh, will cause that property to become a residence. So for example, if you were to rent the property for 280 days and you were to personally use it for 20 days, uh, it's not an issue. It's still reporting Schedule E because it's less than 10%. It's 10% or less. Now, if you do end up exceeding these thresholds and it is considered a residential, excuse me, if it is considered a primary residence under section 280A, uh, there's certain restrictions you now have. One, you cannot deduct the losses, but the losses can carry forward. So in other words, if your rental activity, because it's considered a residence, has a loss, you cannot use it to offset your other income or other passive income even for that matter, um, but it can carry forward with that activity. You also have to pay attention to the ordering rules around deducting expenses. Um, it goes interest, direct expenses, operating expenses, and depreciation. Lastly, you must also allocate your general expenses between personal use days and total days rented or to total days in general. So basically, don't stay in your short-term rental for more than 14 days unless you're going to rent it out. You know, you could rent it out for 300 days and 10% of 300 is 30 days. So you could then stay in your rental for 30 days and not trip these rules, right? So it's 14 days or less or 10% uh, of the fair rental days. But just pay close attention to that because you know if you, if you rent your property for 120 days, then 10% of that's 12, right? So now we're looking at our 14-day threshold since that's more. And if I stay for 15 days, if I stay for one extra day, then I've, I've, I'm toast. Uh, I'm now subject to these rules and I'm subject, I'm subject to the ordering uh, of expenses and the loss limitations. That said, though, if you are personally, if you're staying at a, a property that you own and you're working on it while you stay there, it's not a personal use day. Yeah. So just in case, uh, just in case you're, you're, you're coming up close, you don't want to leave, make sure something breaks. So you have to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> make sure something breaks. All right. <laughs> That's the Italian coming out. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding a little bit with that. I'm being a little, it's, that was taking tongue in cheek right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, it, you know, it, it could be a, a, a good strategy. Although 
I guess you'd have to kind of align. I guess the tax benefits would have to pay off. You'd have to do some some spreadsheet analysis that morning. You know, like do I need to go break something today to repair? <laughs> got to think what's fast the cost <laughs> what's the cost versus avoiding these rules the tax savings of avoiding these rules uh, well thanks so much for listening to this episode next episode we're going to be going through tax court cases for short-term rental owners so these these rules have been te- tested in tax court in the past we're going to dig up some of those cases read the opinions and give you our thoughts on those opinions uh, before we turn off for today, please go to, uh, if you're interested in learning a lot more, getting a really solid foundation of taxes and how it pertains to real estate, uh, check out our tax strategy course. You can go to www.therealestatecpa.com, click the education tab, and you'll see a link to the tax strategy foundation course. It is eight ninety seven. dollars uh, You do get access to a community, 12 hours of content, pre-recorded videos, uh, and uh, our team's in there answering questions as you're as you're going through the material. You get tools, you get homework, and then we got a couple bonus sessions as well. So go check that out. And if you're interested in purchasing, use code RECPA for one hundred dollars off. Uh, we'd love to see you in there. And if you love the podcast, go give us a five star review. I'm calling on you to give us a five star review. We we love the fact that you're willing to spend five minutes giving us a five star review adding context for other people that are finding our, our podcast and wondering if they should be listening. Seriously, your, your help with that is amazing. We love you. Thanks so much for listening to the Real Estate CPA podcast. 